You're watching The Breakfast Club. Yep, it's the world's most dangerous morning show, The Breakfast Club. Charlemagne the God, Angela Yee, DJ Envy is not here, but we got our guy in the building. He goes by the name of John Batiste. What's happening, sir? Yes, indeed. What's happening with you? You probably see him on the Colbert show. Yeah, uh, yeah. The, the leader of the band. That's right, that's right. You got to lead the band, uplift the people. How, how, did, how did that gig come about? Man, so I was doing a tour back in 2013. I had put out an independent record, and it ended up being number one on Billboard for a month, jazz charts. Mm -hmm. So I was I was thrilled, and, and at the end of this tour, we had maybe played in some in some part of Aspen, Colorado, I don't even remember, but some of the producers from the Colbert Report were in the audience. So they said, you should come talk to Steven. So I was like, okay, great. And uh, we sat down and talked, and we really had a chemistry. Mm -hmm. when, when I talked to him, I felt I felt his spirit. Mm -hmm. and, and we became friends, and I took his number, we'd hang out sometimes after the show, and um, he invited me to his finale, which was like crazy. Like Henry Kissinger was there. <laughs> like it's all kind of people was in there, and I was like, "Dang, this is for real." This when he was on CBS, or he yeah, was still on no, Comedy Central. He was on Comedy Central. Okay, okay. So then uh, after that, maybe like a few months after that, people had come up to me and they were like, "We saw you on Colbert Report. Y'all have a great chemistry and vibe. You should really do his new show." And I was like, "Yeah, maybe, maybe so." And then when I finally, in my mind, shift. So many people were telling me, but when I finally shifted in my mind, it was like, "Yeah, I want to do that." No lie, he calls me. Like, I want you to come to my office. I want to chat with you about this new opportunity. I knew what it was. But mm -hmm. he was, I want to chat with you about this. So I sat down with him. We had like a three hour long conversation really about um, what he wanted the show to be. And I met all of the, the team that he had worked with for the last 10 years on the old show. And I just felt a family vibe. And I was like, man, definitely. Yeah, I'm in. And then from there, I took my band, who I've been playing with since. We went to Juilliard together. So okay. A lot of us went to Juilliard, and I expanded the band to really make it make it work for a show. Because a TV show, this is a specific type of gig. It's not like any of the gigs that you would play either live or scoring a movie or scoring a, another television show because there's so many elements. You're dealing with the corporate. You're dealing with the live because you're playing for 500 people a night. You're dealing with being on camera, having to do bits. Um, even writing certain things or brainstorming certain ideas. you sure it's spontaneous sometimes. Yeah, you don't know what's going to happen in the news or you don't even know what's going to happen on stage that night. Mm -hmm. So you got to be able to improvise, but also you have to have stuff legally cleared. Mm. Now you can't just and play anything you want. You can't want. just play anything yeah. you want. So it, it, it makes you, sometimes we have to learn something in our ears, which is like, you know, we get these inner devices where if I press the button, you can't hear what I'm saying in the audience if I'm talking into this mic, like I'm talking to the mic, but the band can hear me in their ears. And then I'll be like, yo, play play that Adam and Eve, Nas. We got to play that in five minutes. And we so quick now where it's like Joe, who's on the drums, he'll play it on a laptop. The band will be listening to it. And then five minutes later, we'll play it like we rehearsed it. <laughs> wow, that's amazing. That's not that, that's yeah. not a that wasn't a, a dream of yours growing up though, right? Because I mean, I remember oh. growing up watching talk shows. Only person I can remember is was, was it Paulie on Letterman? That was the name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Paul Schaefer. Paul Schaefer. Paul Schaefer. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I can't think. I even think about like, who was Arsenio's band. I can't even remember. Yeah, yeah. Some shows the band was less a part of the show. Paul and David. That was more like kind of yeah. what it is now, where it's like it's a team, and 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 I like that. I didn't really think I was gonna be doing this. I, to be honest, you know, I came to New York from Louisiana just to play jazz. I, I was listening to records. This is back when we had liner notes, and and I was just a nerd, man. I go to the store buy like a stack of records from like uh, Common, Led Zeppelin, like just a, a range of music, and read every part of the liner notes. And I noticed a lot of the records that I was really checking out and digging what made in New York. Mm -hmm. I, I read who was playing on the record. I was reading who was playing, and, and, and a lot of people, they lived in New York, and then I was like, well, I need to go to New York. So when I was 17, I decided to move to New York. Um, I got into Juilliard and started a band, and then we just started playing around. I, I really, all I wanted to do was just pursue the art and mm -hmm. play and just be great. And really like, you know, you think about like Nina Simone, Louis Armstrong, like the greats. Um, I just wanted to be that. 
and it's just led me to so many places. I'm I'm just very blessed to even have so many opportunities playing in so many places around the world. How does a, a young black man get into jazz? Man, jazz is the lost art you know form what, of black people. What part of Louisiana are you from? Well, you know, you know, Kenna, Louisiana, was. What the airport mm, I know is. Where that is. You know that? Yeah. As a matter of fact, they were just on the news recently because yeah, uh, the, Nike, the mayor. Man, that's dude. Mm -hmm. It's just. And then when you go to the airport, it's like, welcome to Kenner. You yeah. You see that sign. Yeah. Because whenever I go to New Orleans, I always am amazed, like, when we're in New Orleans, at how I see all these young, talented kids, like, playing instruments. Mm -hmm. And everywhere you go, there's a lot of um, culture mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in Louisiana. Well, the thing about it is you talk about jazz and I just think about culture and the culture creators and it's America's music, it's black people's music, it's black American music. And I just feel like sometimes it's forgotten mm. and people don't really understand the power of it. it it's a superpower. Mm -hmm. It came through so much. So many people had to die and so many people had to go through hardships, but it's brought so much joy. You can get in the club and it's crazy. The experience can be something that you don't get in any other form of music. Yeah. And I love all forms of music, but the thing is, they all offer something different. Yeah. It's like different people have different personalities. And jazz to me is that thing that, if people tapped into it more, I think it'll just help them to kind of enrich their life. It'd be, it'd be better. And um, I mean, that's what I, I do. That's that's really what I love. I White agree. men did take over jazz though. They whitewashed it real bad. Kenny yeah. Chesney. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's, it's it's a struggle sometimes, like when you go on tour and you're playing in the audience, you don't see people who look like you. Yeah. But I I see a lot of that changing, man. This the generation that's coming is much more free. They're just so open. Like I'm in the generation right when streaming and the internet hit. So I remember when you had to go to the record store, and then also when you could just get anything a touch of a button. But I think now since it's so open, their mind doesn't have genres, it's not split. They're just looking for experiences. And that's the dope thing about what I do when I'm playing for people, when I go sometimes we tour and I go to high schools, I even go to like middle schools and, and, and the young people, man, it's inspiring. They're just so open. Mm -hmm. I get I get fed by that. Cause, yeah. just, Cause the energy, it's like, oh man, this is brand new. Wow, let me check this out. And they really get to a, um, a place with it that's just pure. But then I think guys like you, uh, you know, change the narrative of it because they see you mm -hmm. on television. You cool. Yes. You know what I mean? They know you're getting money. So they're like, right. oh, let me let me tap into this jazz thing. I feel like jazz for us has always been kind of a cool thing anyway, just what, the way it's been infused into hip hop. When we see it like in movies, like you watch a Mo Better Blues or yeah, yeah. Gangstar, they did the whole Jazz oh, Mataz album. And Nas's dad was a jazz musician. Olu Dara. Mm -hmm. Yes, indeed. Nas was just on the, on the Late Show recently. We played together on the show. Um, and we played throughout the night, you know, for the commercial breaks, uh, for the guests that come on when they walk out. My job in terms of the show's function is to play music, almost like music in a play, um, to kind of set the mood for the show. And, when that, and that night we played all Nas beats and all Olu Dara compositions. Wow. So like I do little stuff like that. Right. And I get a lot of letters or people tweet at me and say, what was that tune? I, what were y'all playing? And that's a cool way to kind of, like you say, expose people to the music. Even if it's just like five seconds, 10 seconds here or there, they feel the vibration of it. It's, it's crazy. Yeah, the first time I did the show, y'all played uh, Put Some Respect on it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> From uh, the, the, the Birdman interview, but that was the Hamilton. Hamilton, yeah, 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 that yep. was their version. Yep. <laughs> Yeah, I love I love throwing stuff. We play stuff from, like, I mean, we'll play even some classical music. Like, we'll play Bach, play Beethoven. We'll play like we'll play jazz. We'll play all of the tracks. Like some of the sometimes you don't know, the sample comes from an actual jazz record. Mm -hmm. So sometimes what I like to do is play the record, and then actually like the DJ plays the record, and then switch back into the live version. Kind of that mashup. Sometimes we do that. Uh, sometimes we'll have like music that's folk music from Africa, folk music from China. We're, it's it's open, man. It's just whatever we feel in the moment that fits the show. What did your parents or your family do when you were raised? Just were they musical as well? Oh yeah, yeah. Well, my mother's not musical at all, mm -hmm. but I got a lot of gifts from her. She had an anointing. She was something. 
special. She still is special. And my father is a musician and obviously was like my first mentor. He was a bass player. He had seven brothers. They had the family band. It was like a tribe on stage. <laughs> and then, uh, so I had 30 cousins from them seven uncles. And that they were sometimes part of the band when they got older. Mm -hmm. And I was the youngest cousin at the time. So I think by the time I was seven or eight, I was playing drums, percussion and stuff like that. And then 11, I switched to the piano. And when I switched to the piano, that's it clicked. I mean, I got these big old hands. I was either going to be a pickpocket or a piano player. <laughs> but I mean, the thing is, I just used it, used it to kind of, you know, find myself. Because I was a real quiet kid, real, real um, introspective, mm -hmm. just checking out the world around me, just taking in things. And music really actually helped me to kind of come out of my shell. So nobody taught you? You kind of taught yourself? Man, I, at first, I actually learned from playing video game music. Huh? Yeah, like, you know, you watch, you, you, you look at a video game for five, six hours a day. You know, I'm from the generation we play Super Nintendo, Sega Genesis, PlayStation, even going on to and Dreamcast, all that stuff. And you playing the game, and the music is, is, is in your subconscious yes. constantly, constantly. And you, you know, nine or 10 years old, you don't know how that's influencing you. And then I end up going into the field of music and being a composer and a musician and a ranger. So all this music is hitting me in a way where now when I'm writing, that's coming out of my subconscious. It's just how my brain works. I kind of, the notes come in and I don't know how they're going to come out, but it's like a flood when it come out. And that, that, that's what was in there. That's what I was putting in the subconscious. You feel like it's a gift you were born with? Like this is something that, because, you know, they say some people are born with certain talents, especially mm -hmm. when it comes to music. Yeah. I, I think you got to be born with a certain amount of it. But also I think that we lost, in the culture, we lost a lot of the, the, the love for music as a fabric, in, uh, in, as a part of the fabric of everyday life. Mm. Music as... Let's all just get around the piano mm -hmm. and sing a song together. Yeah, like how fun. we used to do in the fields and slavery or anything. Like you know what I mean? Well, that's just, what we needed to do. Yeah, 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 yeah. Just to stay sane. Yeah. yeah. It's a it's a way it's a way for us to really connect and be together and then not really be about, okay, let me sell tickets, uh, let me sell a record, you know, what whatever it is. The commodification of music is fine. And it's beautiful to be able to share your music with people across the world. I've benefited from that, the industry of that. That's great. I'm not saying anything against that, but I'm saying that music is way more than just that. Yeah. It's hard not to be a critic nowadays either yeah. with social media. So it's Everybody like you can't got a just voice. enjoy the music. Yeah, you know what I mean? Like you put an album in and instead of just listening to it to enjoy it, you got to critique it to death. <laughs> right. Well, the thing is, I don't really like critiquing music. Um, I like to check music out because it's a perspective of a person. Mm. Music is a voice of a person and their experiences, whether you relate to them or not. So that's why I don't really have like a favorite genre or favorite thing. But I do think that music serves a, a, a function in different parts of your, your life. You can use it. It's like a person. A song can be like a person. It could be like a friend. Like if you're going through a heartbreak, put on a certain song, and it help you to kind of have solace in that moment. Or if you're going through like a moment where you really need to meditate and focus and just get to your vibe and just block, block out the world around you. Then like, there's music for that. I feel like we've been, we very homogenized, we're getting very, very homogenized in terms of the music that we are experiencing it. And that makes our experience as human beings very linear mm. and simplistic. We need to like, open it up. Yeah, I do feel like things are so categorized now. Like, I remember growing up and you would listen to the radio and they would play all different types of genres of music on one station. Yeah. And we all kind of knew the same songs, even if it was a rock song or right. if it was a hip-hop song or if it was a country song. Yeah. It was all kind of in one place, but now it's very separate. Like, this station plays this type of music and this is what I listen to. And, yeah. you know, even the way that people sell music, like, I remember talking to a woman who did punk rock music, but she's black. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But they would never categorize it like that because right. she was black. Yeah. See, that's just remnants of race stuff. Mm -hmm. Yes. But, you know, that's the beautiful thing about music. It transcends all of that. 
when you feeling good and, you, and and laughing and dancing with the people next to you and like y'all getting down, it's a it's a vibe where that don't matter. I feel like eventually we're gonna transcend all of that. It goes in cycles. Cause it's a form of segregation. Like, yeah. You know, what you described as a form of segregation. Yeah. I remember when Rihanna, they wouldn't play Rihanna records here because they said Rihanna was a pop artist. <laughs> I'm straight up. <laughs> and then, then it all changed. I think it changed around when Katy Perry and Juicy J did Dark Horse. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. So we started playing Katy, so then they started playing the, the Rihanna records too. Oh my God. Yeah. See, see, that's something, um, I mean, the Godfather, Quincy Jones, he's, he's one of my mentors and I got a chance to spend a lot of time with him in the recent years and he So you like Brazilian music. Yeah. Yeah. He you know about that. Quincy <laughs> Qu Quincy always told me he wanted to do something with New Orleans music and Brazilian music. Yeah. He's still working on that. Like he's still working on the idea of taking all of the sound because it comes from Africa. Mm -hmm. And then the African diaspora went to different parts of the world and exploded and changed and evolved. You know, it went to the Caribbean. It went to um, New Orleans, where I'm from, went to Cuba, and, and, and went to Haiti, and all of these different strains of it, Trinidad and Tobago. Mm -hmm. But Brazil, he loves that. But he was just like, man, you should, um, you you have responsibility to help decategorize American music, change mm -hmm. it, open it up. It's all love, man. Like I think about how racist, like with country music, I remember them being upset at black people doing country music. Right. Which I thought was so crazy. You remember all of that? Like, it was a lot of drama behind that. Yeah, Hootie and the Blowfish, yeah. they never really accepted Hootie or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, it's... Darius Rucker. It's crazy, though, because I feel like, again, it's a perspective. Mm -hmm. The black perspective in country is, is just as relevant as the white one. It's just a different one. And you may not hear it as often, which I think is interesting because when I listen to music, I'm listening to the soul of the person. And that's really what moves you. Like when you hear, like you checking out Wayne record, or you checking out like Marvin Gaye, or you know, like all the range of people, like you hear in their soul. And that's, uh, you can't hold that back. It's it's gonna come out. Well, here's your album, Hollywood Africans. Here, pass this to Charlemagne. Oh, yeah. So he has a copy. Hollywood Africans. Mm -hmm. That's right. What does that mean? Well, actually that's Jean-Michel Basquiat is um, an artist from the 80s. And um, he lived in New York. He died very early. He died when he was 27. He was a genius. He actually just sold, um, uh, after his death, uh, obviously, but he sold a painting for $110 million, um, from Sotheby's, which for a black artist is unheard of. That's like the level of Picasso. Mm -hmm. mm. That's like saying a black dude from New York can be looked at like Picasso and the money speaks for itself. Somebody felt that enough to spend that money on that. So that's changed the art world. But I've been studying Basquiat because I'm actually, we're greenlit to do a musical. And you're writing? I'm writing the music musical. and lyrics. Wow. But uh, one of his works is called Hollywood Africans from 1983. Yep. And it has so much information about the black experience in entertainment mm. and how how you have to Back back then, especially, he was talking mainly about the 40s, how you have to put on a mask and be a certain way in order to have the ability to create and do your art. And he was kind of putting putting word out that it's still happening. I'm in the 80s, and I'm still dealing with levels of marginalization and oppression. But, you know, I believe that, but I also believe that we have a, a divine calling it's something that just was put in us from the beginning of time no level of marginalization or oppression will stop it from going out into the world damn right it's yeah. transcendent i agree and we gonna feel like you had to put on a mask to do what you do we still deal with that it's part of it not with that big ass afro <laughs> <laughs> no mask you I, know what you are you okay. know <laughs> it's it, i feel like part of the record is actually it's me saying this is me raw, stripped down. You don't have to do that. I don't have to do that because they did that. Nah, I can do things. There's so much opportunity, man. It's just so much that we can do now because so many people set it up for us to just kill it. We can like, I mean, we were talking about that, just the mm -hmm. level of, I mean, the openness in terms of industry and creativity and access. I mean, I'm I'm a young guy. I'm here 
I, I just feel blessed to even be able to do this. I wouldn't have be able to have done this. What I'm doing now, writing a musical, I'm on TV, I'm traveling the world, playing music. What? It's amazing. Especially coming from where you come from. Oh my goodness! You know, I, you could have went any route. Oh yeah. Well, you know, it's 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 a lot of different paths that you know you you can get lost in the sauce. But I feel like we. That's why I just really want to keep showing people that there's another way. Young people, especially, come up to me or young musicians um, in particular ask me for advice and I'm just like man just just be you mm -hmm. stay focused if you stay focused and you are yourself and you don't break the contract that you make with yourself mm. whatever that is you golden you soar that resonates with people that changes the world that's when people are like man if he could do it I could do it right I always wanted to do artists like yourself see the world the way a Basquiat saw the world, like visually in your mind. Like, do you see notes in your head? Do you see song structure? Like, man, I sometimes I can't turn it off. It's 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 not. I don't see notes, but I see images if that makes any sense. Um, like different parts of the songs to me create. A, a whole different picture and and the picture can change as the song changes and that's how I remember music that's how I create music with images in mind I'm thinking about wow what where is this who's singing it mm -hmm. who are they singing it to you know and, it's this whole story behind yeah, it yes it's, it's a narrative to it do you think that producers should know how to play instruments like as far as music producers, because some some of them don't. Mm -hmm. But do you think it would help them if they actually learn how to play instruments? I think any information helps doesn't hurt. I, I, I also know a lot of great producers and have worked with producers in many different genres who don't play instruments, and I've learned a ton from them. Mm -hmm. The way some people play the laptop is like an instrument. But I will say this, that the to me, the greatest and most... I, I'll say diverse artists, musicians, whatever, all have some understanding of music and are able to use it to kind of create something that's not only innovative, but they create longevity for themselves. Mm. I feel like it's difficult in a field of music or the creative arts to not know the craft and create anything that is um, ultimately stands the test of time or that's innovative in a certain way. Yeah, because you don't got no point of reference. There's no bar. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like, you can listen to Quincy and be like, man, I, I need to make something better than that. Or yeah. As good as that. Yeah, exactly. It, 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 and, and I mean, you think about all of the, the, the great producers that I've, I've worked with, especially if I'm thinking about like stuff that I love, that I, in, in 15, 20 years, when I'm in my, I'm 50, I'm going to be listening to this. That that's what I'm thinking about. Okay, this is like this is not of the moment. Mm -hmm. This is something that somebody they understand music and how it moves the soul, and that is what's gonna stay. And you got see you got your keyboard with you, man. Why? Why? <laughs> well, it. actually, somebody gave it to me. But <laughs> oh, it don't work. I thought you? you just needed to practice every all the time. I just thought. <laughs> Why well, used I to, it was like a bad habit. He's got to practice. <laughs> this 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 is like. I used to do that, actually, when I was walking around town. Mm -hmm. When I first moved to New York, I would carry this around everywhere and play it. Sometimes I'd be playing in the subway. People think I'm like a busker asking <laughs> for money. <laughs> trying to, and they'd be like, what? You got your Starbucks company trying to put change yeah, in? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's some talented people on the subway, by the way, I know. Music. I'd be like, damn, you need a deal. We, we had some people on the subway come up and play with us on the show once. It's amazing really? to just have. I, mean, I love doing that. Oh, you ever do that yeah. inspiration, just get on the subway and ride? Oh, for sure. I'm, I mean, it's, it's sometimes it can get weird, but like, <laughs> if I'm not in in um, if, if I put on like a hoodie, I'm not in the uniform. I go down there. Sometimes we go late too, where it's empty. Get on the A train, like two uh one two a.m. It's a wide train. Play. We made a whole um, doing doing the phase before I was on the show. We made a whole record on the subway. Wow. And uh. <laughs> we were playing on, on, on the train and people were like, what's going on? And then after a while, you know, we sit in the same cart for like 30 minutes, play a whole concert for people. And they'll be like, 
man, that made my day. Were people giving you money just because they feel like they're supposed to? Well, that's how, that was like 2011. We made a lot of early fans like that. Oh, that's <laughs> we, dope. We had a lot of fans who just would come out to the shows because they see us on the subway. And then we started doing these things called love rides, where it's like at the show, once it's over for the encore, we'll play a song and then take the audience from the venue and do like a march processional sometimes one, two miles away from the venue to like a park or to like another subway station and bring a party to another party. <laughs> and then people just started being like, man, do the do the love right thing. Do the love right thing at the shows. And and we that's how we kind of started getting on the road touring. And how long you been in New York? Man, since 2004. And ain't lost that accent a bit. No. <laughs> <laughs> it ain't going nowhere, man. It's in me. You still with the you still the band uh Stay Human, are y'all gonna do something to do? A project? Yeah, yeah. Okay. We we gonna do something. Um uh, I, I have about uh n- actually no exaggeration, about ten records in the can. I'm always creating, like, you know, I'm sure you all y'all got stuff where it's like you get up, you work. It's not really for anything just to work. Like this album we started recording this in 2015, and I actually, it, it started with a conversation. I went to Bono's birthday party. I was mm-hmm. playing at Bono's birthday party in 2013, and Bono had this thing where he had all these different performers playing behind the curtain. He didn't know who was coming next. Somebody set it up for him to be like a surprise, and then after the performer play a song, they joined Bono at the table. So uh, Herbie Hancock played, uh, Beck played, Pharrell played right before me, and I played, and then at this party, uh, the the guy I co-produced this record with, T-Bone Burnett, he was at the table, and he's like a, a producer, historian, musician, and we start talking about history of music and all of that. And um, he on this project with you, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and we work, we we worked on and other that's stuff. That's when you guys met. But that's when we met. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we worked on other stuff up until like 2015 when we started cutting this record, and we did three sessions in 2015, two sessions last year, and that was the record. But I'm always like going in between projects, working on stuff. I got like ten projects just in the can that I'm waiting for the right time for the world or to finish them. They're all different stuff. I did some stuff with Manny Fresh, my hometown. Mm-hmm. He was like my hero growing up. Yeah, I bet. Manny Fresh, like every time I go to New Orleans, <laughs> I see Manny Fresh. Don't the... he, he owns a restaurant or something? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Manny Fresh mm-hmm. is is. One of the greats. Oh, without question. And don't ever he doesn't get mentioned as one of the best hip hop producers, which is weird. But he he gets props in in in, in our city for yeah, sure. Definitely. Oh, he DJs and everything. He's always doing something. Have you ever heard him in most Def's album? Oh yeah, I remember when uh they did some of that. That's actually when I first really hung out with him in the studio up at the Red Bull mm-hmm. studio. They did some of that up here. He let you hear it? Yeah, a little bit, but I ain't, yeah. I didn't I ain't really I, I didn't really hear too much. It was just in passing. Now, I can't gonna, wait for that to come out, though. Is Colbert going to put you on as a guest to promote Hollywood Africans? <laughs> oh, yeah. We were on um, um, Wednesday. Oh, you had you? Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. Course, After the right? Nas performance, we came I like on that it. you guys had such an organic relationship, like that you could meet him and then actually become friends and stay in contact. Because I don't, you know. Man, he he's one of the greatest, greatest people. Like it's that South Carolina in him. Yeah, and then it's, uh, South Carolina, especially Charleston area in New Orleans, got a lot of similarities. Tell me about it. Yeah, you. Oh yeah, that's where you yeah. you around there. Yep. I feel mm-hmm. like it's it's just when you got that much space, and I feel like families stay there for generations. Mm-hmm. It's just like it's a community feel. It feel like everybody know each other. Hundred percent. And it, and and it's comfortable. And people, I feel like when you bred in that, you just have manners, and you have a certain way of dealing with the world. That's different to other places. So what was New York like when you first got here? Oh, my goodness. Culture <laughs> shock. That was a big deal because cause I, I I was getting exposed to, like, you know, Lincoln Center, going to, like, the uh, the the Met, going to um, hear music at the operas and all that stuff. But then I was also able to go downtown or go up to Harlem. I lived in Harlem for a minute, and I lived in Washington Heights for a minute, just to... Bro, the range of stuff that I was like checking out and getting exposed to, it was like, I was, I loved it. But what about the people here? Because we were talking about how everything's so family-like and that hospitality. But when you came to New York, 
I don't know that angry. New Yorkers like that. They don't say hi mm-hmm. to you when you I'm walk out the street. Yeah, it it was a little it was a little much, but I feel like I learned that it's because everybody just focused. It's it's a lot to get around here. I think we're also raised differently. Yeah. Like, we're taught to don't speak to people if you don't know them. Right. So when I used to go other places, I would be like, why is that person saying hello to me? I don't know you. Right. And we're taught, like, not to make eye contact with strangers or anything like that because we're always concerned that, that somebody's up to something. Oh, man. It's like the energy, once you get to know New Yorkers, though, is completely different to that. Mm-hmm. Like, I know some of my best friends are born and raised here. And at first, the energy is definitely like, okay, <laughs> what's going on? But then you get to know them, especially one on one. It's it's they open up. Right. It's amazing, man. I love this city. Do the women scare you here? Oh my goodness. Cause you know, <laughs> a lot of women in New York, women down south, they like looking for the best yeah. husband. Yeah. They want a family. Women in New York looking for the best deal. That's oh. what. Yeah. What does that mean? Looking for the best what? deal. <laughs> I don't know that that's true. <laughs> 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 what, what what um what my experience has been has been great. I I I, I know some horror stories though. I thought you were about to say I know I some horror stories. I, I was like, whoa. Hey, 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 hey. <laughs> but, I, but even from being a musician and traveling, I'm sure your interaction with women is always going to be different too. Like they see you on stage, they see you in the club. Yeah, it's, it's a different experience, and you've been doing it for so long. Yeah, it's it's a great thing because going out on the road, I have friends who you know. I'm writing to them. I don't, I may not see them for five years. Like they in like um, Budapest mm-hmm. or like, you know, are we about to go to Europe again? And we going to, I haven't been to Europe in, um, since the last record I put out, which is like 2013. And um, we about to go to France and Berlin and uh, Amsterdam, um, London, playing in like cathedrals. This beautiful, just in, in like to meet people and keep in contact with them for like time. I met you when I was 17, mm-hmm. now I'm 30, and we grew up and like we having dinner in Paris and it's like, oh, uh, like musicians you grow up with. Man, You'd I'm be just like, I'm blessed. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's great. The, the relationships you build, that's everything in life. So, I mean, I just hope to continue to just like not only have success but to just keep building relationships with people and and cultivating those relationships. Because mm-hmm. that's the great thing about being a musician. It's that thing that brings people together and people celebrate to music. People want to see music as a way to forget their problems for a day. And the music that we play is really supposed to heal you. You know, there's music for everything, you know, to dance, you know, there's music... I mean, it's music to get crunk to. I mean, it's crazy. You do all yeah. kinds of stuff, but yeah, I just feel like we got to come together, especially now in the time that we live in with all this divisiveness. Mm-hmm. It's a wild, it's it's a wild time to be an artist and um, to also really care about people because you feel a responsibility to kind of okay, let's lift that sucker up, bro. <laughs> come on, right. absolutely, let's get it up. I now, think John curved our question about women too in a very good way. He basically told women, "Look, I travel a lot, so he if said I don't call about you back, Budapest, yeah, it's yeah. Like, he I said travel a lot. So I, for all these women Budapest. I meet in all these different places, <laughs> if I don't call you back, it's because I'm busy." Okay. <laughs> all, I heard, <laughs> all I heard was booty pass. <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> yeah, no, for real, I know like one person. It's but like I I, I like that. You know, I, one person. Yeah, like, I like, <laughs> I, I got my friend in Budapest. And you haven't you know, called got, her in a while because you're traveling. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I got from the whole time. That's she's what a, I got from the last three minutes. She's in Budapest. She's <laughs> what I'm supposed to do, man. <laughs> FaceTime. John, John Batiste, Hollywood Africans is out, right? Yes, yeah, out today. It's today. Out right now, man. And Go Basquiat, check out. they're going to actually let you guys use the artwork in the play? The Basquiat estate, his sisters, his family, they... Uh, letting us use not only the work that's out, but work people haven't seen. Wow. Stuff that wow. he has, notebooks, photos. It's the first project that the estate has approved. And, I mean, man, that's a... I've been influenced by Basquiat and also just the, the energy of what he did in the world to kind of, like, bridge these gaps. You know, he his, his uh, father's Haitian, mother's Puerto Rican. So I feel a, a kinship to the New Orleans culture, but he also came to New York and like brought that into the art, brought the city into the art, the punk, new wave, early hip hop. 
I mean, it's crazy. And that to be on Broadway and then for me to write that. That's huge. It's like, man. When did that start? Well, we started already. We wrote a, we wrote a lot of stuff, and I'm putting the creative team now to actually put it on stage. So that's going to be a process over the next couple of years. But then as we start going, more stuff will start coming out, previews. We got the great John Doyle, director. He did Color Purple, won the Tony a couple of years ago for Color Purple. He's already signed to do the directing. This is going to I mean, so we amazing. might not see it for a couple of years. Yeah, it takes that long. long. I didn't know it take that long. I didn't know. I yeah. had no idea. You know how hard it is to get a play on Broadway. Wow, it's, it just doesn't. Yeah, it's one of the hardest things to do. Yeah, it's like a. It, it's it's very competitive to get the space and mm-hmm. to get producers. I mean, man, this it's an amazing opportunity. That's why we see a lot of off and off off Broadway plays, but yeah. <laughs> to have this on Broadway is That's amazing. Great. So we're excited. Yeah, congratulations, I can't wait till we get man. to see the previews and all of that. We're invited, right? Yeah, of course. Okay. Come through. Yeah, pull up. Well, go get that Hollywood Africans, <laughs> my man John Batiste. I'll see yeah. you on Colbert Show next month, brother. For sure. You Absolutely. Coming through. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When my book come out. Yep. Word. It's the Breakfast Club.